Thank you so much. My name is Jeremy, and I'm here with Luis. We are on the Intelligent Apps team for .NET. And what our team's been doing for the past couple of years is focusing on the experience of working with Intelligent Apps in .NET. And that's everything from Learn, which is our documentation and our samples that are AI-enhanced samples. We've been working on integration, so we recently announced the Microsoft.extensions.ai, as well as Microsoft.extensions.vector, which are building blocks for building AI and intelligent apps. We also have been collaborating with the community to build a vibrant ecosystem. So we have things like uh, Alama Sharp for running Alama models in C Sharp. We have our open AI client. We have Pinecone. And so we're working with the ecosystem to create local SDKs that you can run from C Sharp and use C Sharp to interface with those, those components. As far as deployment, we know that AI has a lot of moving pieces. And so with technologies like .NET Aspire and our, uh, our uh, deployment CLI with Azure, we're able to bring up those components and build that experience for you. This talk, however, is about starting from scratch. And so what I want to do is take us to an imaginary scenario that you're working in a shop that has no uh, AI at all, no intelligent apps right now. What do we do and how do we start building as .NET developers making those apps more intelligent? So I'm going to jump over to a small application that I've written that is for a support agent. And so imagine that I've got a call coming in and I need to find out what's going on with this customer and help them out. So I'm going to jump into the ticket and figure out which ticket the customer has. And let's say it's the filter cartridge ticket. So we'll look inside of that and notice that what we have is really just the conversation between prior support agents and the customer. So I would need to read through this, figure out the information, and get that context so that I can help that customer. We can actually go to another ticket. Let's pick the uh, SkyMaster X2000, which is a drone, and there's a GPS issue. And unfortunately, if we read through the full dialogue, the customers come to the point where they're actually ready to make a return. But there's a lot of text to go through to get to that. So based on that scenario, I think we can use AI to enhance this application. So let's uh, talk for a second about how we would do that. You've probably heard about large language models, and these are really the brains behind a lot of the AI experiences. And the most common example is that assistant in chat, and that's a great example, and we're going to use that. But there is so much more that a large language model can do. It can do things like summarization. And that's something I'm going to focus on in a second. It can do things like evaluation, which Luis is going to talk about later on in this session. Semantic search. So let's say your customer doesn't know exactly what they're searching for, or even if they misspell something, semantic search will find what that actual phrase is closest to what they're trying to type in and still make that search happen in the way that they expect it to. We've got classification, so automated workflows that need to classify pieces of data and maybe route them into the right workflow. Data generation, I need lots of test data. How do I create that test data? Localization is an amazing feature that large language models can take different language inputs and translate those to different language outputs. And sentiment analysis, and these are just a few examples of what's possible. So let's assume that we wanted to take advantage of summarization. What do we do from scratch to add that to our application? So the first thing I'm going to do is just add a couple packages. And I can use the command line, the NuGet manager, or drop them into my, my CS project file. And what I've added is OpenAI, which I'm going to use for the model. And you can use different services. And we'll talk about how that works with your application. And I'm also adding Microsoft.extensions.ai. The code I need to make this available to my application is really just creating the client and passing credentials, which I have securely stored in the environment, in user secrets, in Key Vault somewhere that's not checked into source control with my application. And I also have this iChat client that I'm spinning up. And there's an extension 
method that spins it up from the API client. So I want to point out that this Microsoft.extensions.ai in this chat client is part of what we recently announced with Microsoft.extensions.ai. And this diagram shows you sort of how this is modeled. But the idea is there are common building blocks to intelligent applications. These are things like chat, streaming chat, and embeddings that we can formalize in a set of interfaces and APIs that are standard regardless of who we're using to provide those services. We can also add middleware, which is so powerful. ASP.NET Core developers are familiar with the fact that they can configure their middleware pipeline. And so we can do things like add caching so that we're not paying the expense of asking the model every time the same question. We can add telemetry. We can even add filtering of, of text, even if the original SDK didn't support that. And then we have our integrations with services like OpenAI, with GitHub Models, which is a really fast and easy way to get started exploring large language models, and Alama support, which is a way of locally running those models. So if you don't want to go to the cloud, all of that is available. Let's say I wanted to change from my OpenAI client to use a locally run Olama client. I would simply take this initialization code and swap it with this code that uses the Olama version. And this example is using Olama Sharp, which is a community maintained SDK that works with Olama. It's part of that ecosystem that we were referring to. So the most important thing for me to do is to prompt. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about where languages will evolve and whether we can have naturally speaking language. And I think of prompts as ways of using natural language to almost execute code because that's what we pass to the model and get a response back. So for an effective prompt, we want to be concise because we do have limitations on how much information we can send over. But we also want to be very specific about what we expect from the model. So you can see we're giving the model the information we need to tell it exactly what we want back. We're limiting the amount of uh, words that we're getting back. And we're telling it exactly how to summarize that. So with that prompt, I can then use the chat client that I initialized earlier and simply ask it to complete that prompt asynchronously. And then it'll come back with a response, and I can show that. So let's actually jump into some code. So I've added those aspects to my application. I'm just going to comment the section that I was just in and uncomment the piece that adds the summarization. We'll save that and come over here. And I'm just going to clear the screen so we've got a fresh palette, so to speak, to work with. And we're going to run that. So now it's compiling the new version that is going to use the summarization that I added. I'm going to inspect the ticket. So first, we'll start with that filter ticket. And what is new is this yellow summary up top. And if you read the summary and you compare it to the text underneath, you'll see it provides a pretty good, succinct way for the agent to quickly understand what's going on with this ticket. So I don't have to scroll through all the text. I can jump right in. So I'm going to go back to the uh, drone ticket here. And again, I've got a very succinct summary. Basically, the customer tried. Now they're ready for a return. And we can go from there. So that is one way that I can just, from scratch, add AI to that application. So now I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to use something called Retrieval Augmented Generation. And all that really means is I'm going to take some present context, some present data, give it to the model as part of my prompt so that it has extra information to act on and can put things in context. For example, it doesn't know about my product catalog. But if I use RAG, I can give it information from the product catalog to help it answer questions. So this is what it looks like in a nutshell. You start with some source of data. In our case, we have PDF documents, one PDF document for every uh, product, basically. It's the manual. We extract the text from that, and then we turn it into what I call the matrix. And this is the green characters that we can't really read or decipher, but it's actually numerical-based vectors that the 
machine, the language model and, uh, for example, a vector database know how to work with so they can do things like see what the relationships between text are and how text should follow other text, et cetera. And so once we have that, we can store it in a vector database, which is simply a database optimized to very rapidly perform queries against vectorized data, and then we pass it to the large language model. Now that's a, a lot of information to take in, but the steps I think you'll find are pretty straightforward for this. I'm going to create my embeddings generator, which is the tool I use to turn the text into the matrix. Then I'm going to configure the service. In this case, we're using an in-memory vector store using the primitives that are available through Microsoft.extensions.vector. And then going back to our, our model here, it lives at this abstraction layer, so there's different implementations, but I can just use that high-level abstraction when I'm passing whatever I want to embed over. And then after we get the text from the page, we split it into logical pieces. We don't want to send over everything at once, so we send over small pieces. And then we simply say, embedding generator, give me back the embedding. And that is then serialized because I don't want to run the embedding every time. I don't need to recompute it. So I'm going to serialize it and save it so I can reference it later. And if you get really curious when you run the example, you can open up the JSON and you'll see that the embedding is really just a set of numbers that the model and the vector database know how to work with. So let's see what happens when I've added that to my model. I'm going to again comment out my summarization piece right here and uncomment the piece that I've added. And then we'll go ahead and clear and compile and run that. And we're going to get back to our familiar ticket system, but you're going to see that I've added a new option for the agent. So when they inspect the ticket, for example, the filter cartridge, here they've got the dialog in the summary. There's the option to chat. So my agent is going to use the chat as a means to get more information specifically to give to the customer so they can direct them. So maybe the agent isn't familiar with this filter. And so they can say, tell me more about the filter. And then the large language model is going to use the RAG information that we sent it along with how it's been trained and provide me with this amount of feedback. And you can see that it's actually quoting quite a bit of text from the manual. So I'm going to type quit here, and then I'm going to go into my GPS ticket. And the logical thing to ask here is how should the customer initiate the return? And it will come through and say, boom, boom, boom. Here's how you do it. Here's the number to call. Great. Let's say I wanted to find out a little bit more information too and say, tell me about the nighttime photo capabilities of this drone. So it's thinking, thinking, and it comes back and tells me it can do stunning nighttime photos. And then I'm going to call out the LLM and say, cite your sources. Tell me where that came from. And based on the given data sources, no specific user queries provided an answer. So that's a little puzzling. What's important to know is we have this concept of responsible AI, and part of that is understanding that models aren't always consistent in the way they return data. Sometimes they even make up data trying to answer it or maybe use it from the web and put it in the context of the question. And so in order to mitigate that, we'll use something called evaluations, which we'll jump into. But before I do that, I do want to jump out of here and address something that I know is probably on the top of everyone's mind, is that, wait, our system is web-based and it's much larger than what you just talked about, right? So how does a system with so many moving pieces work in this intelligent apps arena? This is why we built the eShop support demo project. This is a large-scale microservices-based project. It's built on top of .NET Aspire. And it includes many different components, including the ability to swap between 
a local model using a llama, for example, for a developer experience, to a cloud-based model such as OpenAI. It also includes components like a Python service. And the reason why is because Aspire can wire in that Python service as part of the microservices suite for your application and allow you to use that even if the rest of your application is .NET. So there's no reason to have to go completely to Python or completely to .NET because they can work together inside the same application. So let's take a quick look at eShop support. I'm going to jump into Visual Studio. And here we're looking at the uh, app host and basically the different services that it's setting up. And the way, if you're not familiar with .NET Aspire, you define different resources that have a set of assets and information related to them that simplify the way that different resources can communicate with each other and can discover capabilities and can operate. And this will work in conjunction with our building blocks to give us a very unified way to build our application. Here I'm running the Aspire dashboard. Now I did not set up my Python environment, so it's quickly telling me that there is an issue with the Python piece, and then I can use that dashboard to drill in, find out more information. But I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the UI because I know I'm not using that piece yet, which is why I hadn't configured it. And I'll show you what the experience looks like. So in the UI, I'm going to play the role of a customer coming in to provide a ticket. So I'm logging in as Alice, and we've uh, published the login information right on the demo for you. It's not recommended for production apps, but it makes it easy for us to jump in and start this ticket. We're gonna ask if it's related to a specific product so that we can give that context to the large language model and to the ticketing agent as well. And this is using semantic search to, again, match what the user types in with that, that product. Now, Alice is saying, tell me about the sun safety features of the, the product itself. And then Alice will click Submit, and that will be routed to an agent. This isn't an interactive chat or anything right now. Let's go to the agent side now. So the agent is going to log into the system. And right now, because they're trying to go to the agent control panel, but they're signed in as Alice, they get access denied. So we'll log out, we'll log in as the agent, Bob and Bob. And now we've got a grid that has succinctly summarized the last action on the ticket, gives us an indicator of whether it's a question or if the customer is unsatisfied, including a satisfaction meter so we can see the relative uh, level of, of ire, if you will, of the customer, right? So I can very easily triage what's important for me to look at. When I go into the ticket, not only do I see the summary, but I can scroll through the, the information of the details of the discussions if I need to and find that context. And then what we've also added on the side, similar to our console application, is the ability to chat. And there's even a few sample prompts to help the agent think of things that they can ask the model to help them work with the customer. And so we'll go over to the uh, chat side, and then the agent is gonna type in, and I'll just go ahead and pretend like I'm typing here. <laughs> what is the, are you ready for this? Expected lifetime of the sleeping bag. And so the assistant goes off and comes back and says, according to the product manual, Expected lifetime is 10 years or more. Pretty good answer, very specific, and uh, even referencing the product manual. So when is the best time of the year to take a picture of the Milky Way? I've asked it a totally random question. Here's what's interesting. It came back and said, actually, Milky Way photography is at night, surprise, and it gives me a link into the manual to see. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that link and see where it takes me. And we're clicking, 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 and boom, capture amazing shots. Now what you'll notice is where we landed says nothing about the Milky Way. So this is an example where the response we got was not a great response. It looked very specific, but it wasn't very specific. So now I'm gonna ask it to conclude this transaction. Basically, how should I respond to the customer to assess their level of satisfaction? So I'm saying, 
you know, basically how satisfied are you with this interaction? And it not only gives me a response that I can cut and paste, but it tells me where it was inspired in the manual. Now, because of that last response, I'm a little bit dubious about this, so I'm gonna actually ask for receipts, right? Can you show me your references? And it's gonna come back and say, well, maybe I made an error. This is based on general practices, really isn't based on the model. So how do you deal with situations like that where the model isn't consistent with its responses and how it, it uh, replies? That is where evaluations come in, and I'm gonna turn it over to Luis to share evaluations with you. Awesome, thank you, Jeremy. Um, those were actually some pretty convincing answers. I, <laughs> yeah. I could have believed it, but um, unfortunately, you know, uh, it was making stuff up or, you know, it was providing ungrounded responses. Yes. Um, and so, you know, as software developers, that's a bit of a challenge because we want to be feel confident in what we are shipping. We want to feel, you know, we want to trust the software that we're putting out there um, because, you know, we want to we want to make sure that it's serving our customers' needs and it's being reliable, right? And so, um, couldn't you just write a test for it? And you might be right. Like, sure, let's go ahead and test and evaluate the system. Except that there are a few differences between traditional software and performing AI evaluations, right? And here's just a subset of what those are. Now, we're going to start with the outputs, and we kind of clearly saw there in those examples that the outputs may differ. So in traditional software, uh, your output's given a particular input. The output is predictable. It's going to, you know, time and time again, no matter how many times you run it, you're going to be able to predict generally what that output is going to be, right? A true is true, and right. false is false, and, you know, that's all there is to it. Um, with AI, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit unpredictable, as we saw, because the way that these language models operate is they're probability based, and they're like, "Hey, what's the next likely word to come after this sequence of text?" Right, and so that makes it a little bit unpredictable, even if you're providing the same input. Right. Um, and interpreting the output, what good means, it can be subjective, right? Now, you may have heard this term, which is five-spaced uh, testing or evaluations, right? Where it's kind of like, yep, looks good to me, right? But what's good to me may not be good to you, right? Um, so so that makes it challenging to evaluate AI systems. Um, the other piece here is patterns, right? And so we have this long history of established patterns in traditional software, you know, like TDD, like uh, adding assertions to our software to test that, you know, the, the software is, is, you know, behaving as expected under certain conditions. Um, and with AI, that's a little bit different because, again, because your output is not predictable, you need to sort of test that the outputs or the quality of the results are sort of within a certain range, right? And right. so you have to place thresholds into place, right? Um, and then last but not least, uh, a lot of these uh, patterns, a lot of the libraries, a lot of the frameworks that we use uh, for testing in traditional software, they have really tight integrations into our tooling. So inside of Visual Studio, we have the Test Explorer. Inside of GitHub Actions and, and inside of Azure DevOps, right, you have your CI CD systems that allow you to test on a continuous basis uh, your software applications. Whereas with AI, the tools are still sort of emerging, right? It's still a, a, a fast developing space. And as such, those sets of integrations are yet to develop. Right. And so we've been thinking a lot about this problem here and, you know, how can we bridge that gap between, okay, we have these, this year-long history and experience of testing traditional software applications, but now we have this new set of uh, applications that we want to evaluate and test. So how can we merge and how can we bring those worlds together, right? And so what you're seeing on screen here is that it starts with APIs and libraries, right? So we have been um, working with both customers, we've been working with, um, you know, uh, partners inside of Microsoft as well as Microsoft Research uh, to come up with a set of uh, built-in evaluators, right, that are provided out of the box inside of these libraries that allow you to evaluate these AI applications. And some of these here you're seeing are things like coherence and fluency and groundedness, right? And these allow you to evaluate your applications. Now, those are out of the box and you can just start using them right away. However, if you would like to extend these evaluators, there's a set of extensible APIs and interfaces that provide you with the building blocks to uh, implement your own evaluator. So for example, let's say that, I don't know, you were uh, building an application that writes jokes. Uh, mm -hmm. Groundedness, fluency, coherence. Funniness. Right, exactly. Like, yeah. I want to evaluate, is this funny, right? And so you, would, you could build an evaluator that, that allows you to determine and evaluate how funny something is, a response is. Um, and so you're going to see that that interface here, uh, one of the things that I'll kind of call out here is this chat message. So 
In addition to itself providing, these sets of libraries providing uh, their own ex extensible APIs, they also build on top of the foundations that we talked about earlier, which is Microsoft extensions.ai, right? So again, you're building on top of a solid foundation. Now, in terms of patterns, right, uh, one of the things that you may already have your testing framework of choice. And so how can you now leverage it to evaluate these AI applications? The two main things what I have here is a test. And the two main things that I want to call out here is that the fact up there looks uh, fairly familiar. And the assertion at the bottom there, right, should also look familiar. The only difference that I'll call out here that is that instead of you know, having a, a sort of a, a, an objective or a predictable output, we're evaluating the relevance in this case, the relevance metric, um, you know, based on whether it's good. And there is some measure of good here, right? So that's a okay. slight tweak. But the patterns are generally the same. This looks like a test. And then last but not least, because you're leveraging those frameworks and the libraries for testing that you are you know, traditionally used to, right? well, doesn't it just make sense that it should also integrate with your tooling? Right. And so that's one of the goals here as well, that it should integrate natively into the tooling. And so what you're seeing here is a set of evaluations on the left-hand side in the Test Explorer. And on the right-hand side, you're seeing uh, a report that gets generated um, inside of Azure as part of a, a pipeline uh, inside of Azure DevOps. Nice. All right, so let's see. So, how exactly do these AI evaluations work? Uh, generally speaking, it starts with a prompt, right? So you yeah. showed us what a prompt was. And in this case, we're providing a prompt to a language model to generate an answer, all right? At that point, uh, we can also provide a ground truth or what exactly is the expected output. What's or, the, right. Exactly, exactly. What's the expected output? Um, and then we provide that to the evaluator. So what exactly does the evaluator look like? Well, we saw what the, um, we saw what the interface generally looks like, but what we're actually providing is we're also providing it a prompt that provides a, a combination of either a user prompt, the generated answer, and the ground truth to perform the evaluation. So we use the language model actually as our critic <laughs> to determine and rank, rate, hey, how well is, are these responses, whatever that, that response it is that you're evaluating for. right? And then last but not least, uh, that's kind of what produces that evaluation result. So let me just jump here to a quick demo of what this looks like in action. So you're going to see here I have an X unit test project. Um, again, it's going to look very similar to what you were seeing there. And if I were to, to what we saw on the slide there, if we right click run here inside, what this is going to do is it's going to send this eval question. Uh, and it's going to use this helper method evaluate question to go ahead and generate that evaluation. Right? It's going to generate the response. It's going to evaluate the response and then return to me after a few seconds. Um, you know, the scores here. Okay. All right, so that comes back, and we see yeah. that the test passes. And now we can determine, you know, if we need to take action, for example, if it failed, if there's anything else that Prove the prompt. Exactly, or exactly. Yep. Um, now, all of those runs and all of these iterations, they're actually persisted, right? In this case, we are persisting them on disk. And so what you're seeing here is that there's also a set of tools here that if you run the .NET AI eval report uh, set of tools or commands here, provided the path where you store those runs and you have all of that information, you can generate this really nice report that provides you with visuals as to, you know, uh, for each iteration and for each question that you sent over, what were those metrics and what were the results of those evaluations, okay? So with that, mm -hmm. uh, AI evaluations are coming soon to the .NET ecosystem, so we can't wait. Stay tuned in the next few days. You're going to hear a little bit more about this, and uh, we can't wait for you to try it out and try out a lot of the things that we talked about here today. We gave them a sneak peek sneak ahead of peek. time, sneak right? Sneak peek, yes. exactly. So stay tuned. Um, so that concludes our talk. Make sure to go ahead and get .NET 9. And uh, check out the list of resources here that we have both in docs and samples so you can get started.